welcome to the Berean Bible Fellowship. Are we excited to see everybody today? Today is Sunday, December the 15th. Mm -hmm. wow. That was my mother's oh, birthday. birthday. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was Cindy's birthday. Yeah, Cindy's birthday. birthday. Send Cindy, yeah. I sent Cindy a message. You I wish I had the birthday. birthday. Yeah, I saw her on uh, Facebook. Amen. So let's turn our cell phones uh, down, if we would please. And turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. And it is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. And the topic or the title of our message this morning is Why is Paul Misunderstood? So we're going to attempt to answer that question this morning. Why is Paul, our apostle, the apostle to the Gentile, why is he so misunderstood by so many? I think that's a good question. Well, let's read well. Read chapter 3, verse 16. And I'll begin reading 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 16. I don't really like to just grab a verse out of the middle. There's so much before and after it here, but this is going to zoom right into our point here, and I'm going to just make a point out of part of what he says in this verse. Uh, verse 16, 2 Peter 3, verse 16, as also in all his epistles, and Peter's referring to Paul, and if we back up to 15, let's back up to verse 15, and he says, in account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Peter talks about our Lord's suffering. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him. Now Paul had wisdom given to him that was apparently very different than the wisdom given to Peter and others. So we're going to see that in a second here. Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you. So this is interesting. Peter has his own audience of course the Jews and the dispersion and the dysphoria, right? But he mentions here that Paul has written to his audience. Paul wrote to Jews and Gentiles. And we're going to see in Acts chapter 9 when the Lord is talking uh, about Paul being his chosen vessel and he's chosen to, to, to witness to Jews and Gentiles and even kings Paul's going to witness to. The Lord mentions who's Paul, who his audience is going to be. But Peter here also mentions the fact that Paul wrote to his audience. This is really an amazing thing. And when we get to Romans chapter 10, we see that Paul actually talks about grandfathering in Jews from the previous dispensation if they will accept Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Paul is the one that preached the gospel of the grace of God. Why is Paul so misunderstood? We're going to find out very shortly here. And look at verse 16 again. As also in all his epistles. So Paul, or Peter mentions Paul's epistles, his letters, speaking in them of these things. What things? The Lord's suffering. Paul speaks about the Lord's suffering. And Paul talks about the Lord's suffering in a way that's different from the other writers of Scripture. When you read Peter's presentation, Peter blames the Jews. He says, you crucified the king of glory. You crucified and nailed him to a cross. And he's, he's hammering a verdict of guilty on these folks. Right? You crucified the, 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 the author of life. Paul glories in the cross. Peter accuses them. He's not praising them. He accuses them, right? And they're like, oh my gosh, what should we do? We, we killed our own Messiah, right? Which they did, and they were guilty. Peter, what Peter said is 100% true. Paul's emphasis is quite different. Paul talks about Christ's death, burial, and here he is, the resurrected Lord. And he glories in the cross. Two different approaches, two different attitudes altogether, with two different audiences. We're going to see this all throughout. So Peter says, as in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, that these things are the sufferings of Christ, in which are some things... Hard to be understood. Now what's hard to be understood is the mystery. Why is it hard to be understood? Because it was never before revealed. It was hidden. It was kept secret. 
That's why. And the problem isn't that it's so hard to understand. The problem is people refuse to believe what it says. That's the answer to the question. So we're not making you wait to the end of the message to get the answer to why is Paul misunderstood. We're telling you right up front. Paul is misunderstood because people refuse to believe what he said. Not only are they refusing to believe what Paul himself said, and we're going to look at that, they refuse to believe what even Peter says. Right? They're, they're refusing to believe what Peter says. They're going to refuse to believe what the Lord Jesus says regarding Paul and Paul's ministry. And we'll read this in Acts chapter 9 and Paul's conversion. You talk to a lot of believers today and a lot of them, they have some crazy negative thing to say about Paul. They don't like Paul. They say, well, Paul was, a, Paul was, Paul was sexist. Paul was racist. Paul, Paul was a homophobe, a xenophobe. All the nonsense you hear people using all these names that they like to cast at people today, they lay, they lay all those charges at Paul's feet. Matter of fact, they started with Paul before they started blaming the rest of the Christians. <laughs> we, we were hearing this stuff about Paul way back in the 1960s. It's just now becoming very popular on the news now to use these expressions, xenophobe, uh, homophobe, uh, uh, Islamophobe, and all these phobes, all these fears and phobias that they're bringing up now. And they just throw, they just throw these names at you. I, one of my best friends I grew up with, I love this guy very dearly. We were best friends growing up. And, uh, you know, we're on opposite sides of the fence politically. And he got mad at me one day. He goes, you're a racist. He called me a racist because I believe we should have a border. I believe in legal immigration. You know, I was in China for five years. I did not break into China illegally. <laughs> no. I applied for a visa, a work visa. And I went there and I worked legally. And I even preached the gospel. Well, both legally and illegally. <laughs> I, I, I did break that one law, okay. I, I am guilty there. But but for the most part, when I went to China, I went there legally. I didn't disrespect the people of the country. I didn't disrespect them. I didn't jump over the Great Wall, right? Or crawl under it or go around it and try to sneak into China. No. There are laws. And you have to follow the law. We support the police. Sometimes the police don't do what they're supposed to do because they're sinners just like the rest of us, right? There's some bad ones out there, but you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. When you're in trouble, who do you call? You don't call Ghostbusters. You call, the, you call the police, right? And hopefully they do what they're supposed to do. And most of the time, the vast majority of the time, they do do what they're supposed to do. And when your house is on fire, you're not against the fire department, are you? No. You're very happy when the authorities show up and do what they're supposed to do. They're in place. God put them in place for our blessing and our benefit and for, and for the protection of society. That's a good thing. Well, let's not go down a rabbit hole here. Let's get back on track quickly. I can do that pretty easily. 2 Peter 3.16. He says that Paul's writing is, some of these things are hard to be understood. Well, if you don't believe what you hear, you can't advance on to the next level. Amen. You know, with Scripture, there's levels. You know, I, you know, my sport is boxing. I was boxing since I was about 12 years old. And one thing I realized with boxing is there are levels. And I see people who watch the sport, and they watch a fighter like Floyd Mayweather, and they say, oh, he's boring. These are casual fight fans. A casual fight fan will say, well, I watched Anthony Joshua and Andy Ruiz a couple weeks ago, and, well, that fight was boring. Oh, all Joshua did is run around. No, he fought a brilliant fight. He fought, he fought a very smart fight. He measured the distance between him and the other fighter, and he, and he made sure that he could hit Andy Ruiz, and he made sure Andy Ruiz couldn't get in the strike zone to hit him back. That's a smart fighter. He didn't do that the first time. First time he stood toe to toe in close. A lot of people like to see it when guys mix it up, they're standing there toe to toe, throwing punches at each other, and somebody is definitely going to get knocked out. Right? Somebody is going to go down and most of the time will not go to the distance. But if you're smart, you will float like a butterfly and stay like a baby. 
You're going to stick and move. You're going to hit and you're going to get out of the way. Well, that's being smart. That's not being dumb. But you know, with Scripture, it's the same thing. There are levels. And I hear Floyd Mayweather say all the time, hey, there's levels. This guy's not at my level. We're talking about your IQ, your spiritual IQ, or in boxing, your boxing IQ. Do you understand what's going on and what it's going to take for you to accomplish your goal? Well, in Scripture, we're told to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Word. And a lot of times we'll have discussions with people. And Junie, you see me a lot of times, I just walk away. I don't, I won't suffer a fool. I don't do it. Why? Because if I have a, a like one of our young people here today, what grade are they in? Third grade? Fourth grade? You're not going to talk about trigonometry to a boy who's seven or eight years old who hasn't really mastered multiplication and division yet. Why would you waste your time? You're only going to cause great confusion. Well, do you realize that talking about the mystery, the revelation of the mystery to somebody who doesn't even understand why you shouldn't be baptizing people today, you're wasting your time. You have to start out with the ABCs before you can get to the XYZs. And why is Paul hard to understand? He's hard to understand because we have a lot of baby Christians. We have a lot of carnal believers. We have people who don't believe in rightly dividing the word of truth. We have some people, some ministries, quite a few ministries out there, that aggressively attack right division. Aggressively attack the ideal of a dispensation. They say, oh, well, you're a hyper-dispensationalist. That's what they say. You're a hyper-dispensationalist. What that really means is you believe what the Bible says. You believe Scripture. And they say, oh, no, no, you're taking the dispensation way too far. Well, how far should I take it? Should I take it as far as you take it? Which is not at all. We, we, have, we have two camps in the body of Christ. There should only be one. We have two. We have covenant theology. They reject dispensations. They reject right division. They think that Paul and Peter were teaching the exact same thing. They think there's, there's really no difference between what Peter taught and what Paul taught. Well, how strange that is. Because why would Peter say there's some things which Paul teaches which are hard to understand if they're teaching the exact same thing? How absurd. They're not teaching the exact same thing. When you get over to Galatians, let's turn to Galatians chapter 2. We've covered this before. But let's, let's do a quick review in passing. Turn to the book of Galatians. Chapter 2. Chapter 2, and we're going to look at... Uh, back up uh, to about verse 4, chapter 2, verse 4. Oh, let me go all the way back. Let's start, let's start right at verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. I want to put this thing in context. People like to argue for no reason. 2, 1. We're going to start right at the very first verse, Galatians chapter 2. And I'm going to read just a little bit, so bear with me. I want to make sure you're not confused when you get to verse 7. I understand it really well, so I just grab verse 7, and that's more than enough. But people like to argue, so let's make sure we develop the context so that there's no confusion, and no one can argue with you this very simple point. So, Paul speaking, then 14 years after, after what? His salvation, after he got saved, Lord of Damascus, and so forth. 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and took Titus with me also. So Paul's returning to Jerusalem. Remember, he was on the route to Damascus when he got saved, when he when he was struck down by that light, by the Lord. And I went up by revelation. So he was instructed to go up. That's what that means. When he says, I went up by revelation, it wasn't just, oh, I felt like going and I'm just going to go. You know, <laughs> some, sometimes... You're, you're going someplace because the Lord directed you to go someplace. You're going there because you know you're supposed to be there, like church this morning. Right? 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 You're here because you're supposed to be here. But 
Sometimes we go someplace on a whim. Oh, I, I, I think I want to buy a new pair of shoes. I think I'm going to the mall. I think I'm going to go to Salvage on that little shoe shop on, uh, on, on uh, Milton Ave. Right? Sometimes I do that. I get an idea. Oh, I think I want to go over here. I want to buy a coat. I want to buy shoes. I, I just get this feeling that I want to go do something. That's not what Paul got here. Paul went up by revelation. God instructed him to go. It, it was time for him to go. There's a reason why he has to be there. And communicated unto them the gospel, that gospel which I preach. Who did he instruct? Who did he share that information with? Do we know who? Can we guess who? It's going to tell us in a second here. That gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately, privately, he's, giving, he's got a private audience here, to them which were of reputation. He's talking about the twelve He's talking about the apostles who are preaching a different gospel. They're preaching the kingdom gospel. They're telling people to repent and to be water baptized to have their sins washed away. That's what they're teaching. That's not what Paul's going to preach. And we're going to see that in just a minute here. Right? Which I preach among the Gentiles. Paul's gospel. He's speaking to a different audience even because they're not preaching to Gentiles. They don't want to talk to Gentiles. They call Gentiles Goya, dogs. They don't go into their homes, they don't have food, they don't eat with them, they don't sit down with them, they, don't, they, have, they have no interaction with them, they don't want to be unclean even coming in contact with a Gentile. They're not doing it. So when Paul says that, what I preached among the Gentiles, hearing something like that is shocking. You mean you go and you talk to Gentiles? Wow, what are you doing that for? That's a shocking statement. We're not shocked. We read that and we go right past it. We don't get the full weight of the impact of that statement. This is an amazing thing that he's saying. And, I, and, and communicated unto them that gospel, that gospel, not your gospel, but that gospel which I preach. There's a difference here. Let's make sure we catch this. Among the Gentiles. But he went privately. He didn't try to embarrass them in public and all that, you know, out the time of the town square or something. Uh, he, he, didn't, he didn't try to upstage them. He went to them privately to talk to them. These guys which were of reputation, the twelve. He says, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. It's, it's important that I talk to the twelve who are out there preaching their gospel, the message that Jesus himself gave them during his earthly ministry, I have to talk to them, I have to explain to them the difference in, in how God communicated this message to me and, and, and how my audience is the Gentiles, who I've been sent to. Paul's got to lay this out and explain it to them. He's not going there to get their permission. He's not going there to learn anything from them. He's going there to teach them. They're not going to be teaching Paul, even though they spent three years with Jesus during his earthly ministry. Jesus handpicked every one of them and spent three years, except for Matthias. And Matthias came afterward, right? He's the twelfth apostle, not Paul. Paul is not the twelfth apostle. The Catholic Church likes to teach that Paul is the twelfth apostle. A lot of a lot of denominations like to teach that Paul is the twelfth apostle. They like to teach that Paul was teaching the same thing as all the rest of them. We're going to see very clearly here that that is not true. That's incorrect information. And if we're going to understand. Paul's 13 letters, beginning with Romans and ending with Philemon, we need to understand Paul's teaching a different message altogether. And there's no contradiction in the Bible if you rightly divide Scripture. If you do not rightly divide the word of truth, you're going to be confronted with all kinds of apparent contradictions, especially as you're out there witnessing and sharing. Verse 3, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Isn't that interesting? So he, Paul's bringing a guy with him who hasn't even been circumcised. Do you think the twelve want to listen to a guy who hasn't even been circumcised? Who's not part of the covenant? Who wouldn't even be accepted? That's, this is an astonishing section of scripture. How bold Paul is to bring this uncircumcised guy with him in the first place. Wow! This is astonishing. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. How bold. And that because of false brethren, 
unawares brought in. They got a lot of false people mixed in with your group. Now, they had some fake news back then too, by the way, folks. Who came in privately. They had their own CNN. Who came in privately, privily, excuse me, who came in privily to spy out our liberty. They came to see what we were doing. They saw how we were living and they were offended. A lot of Christians today are very offended because, so you didn't get, you didn't get baptized. You didn't, you didn't get water baptized? You must be a low-level Christian if you're a Christian at all. Oh, you're not tithing? What kind of a Christian are you? You must not really be saved. Oh, I bet you don't even speak in tongues. Oh, I bet you don't. No, I don't. Thank you. Oh, no, we don't. Thank you. Amen to that. Right? But they came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ. What's the purpose? Here's the purpose clause. Notice that word that. That introduces a purpose clause, right? A result clause. That they might bring us into bondage. What's their goal? Their goal is to bring you into bondage, to take away your freedom and your liberty in Christ. That's the goal of the false teacher. That's the goal of the denomination, by the way. Get you tithing. Get you water baptized. Get you back under the law of Moses. To take away your liberty, to take away your freedom, and to bring you into bondage. And if you fall for this, Christ profits you nothing. If you're circumcised, he says, Christ profits you nothing. If you're getting water baptized, Christ profits you nothing. If, if you're speaking in tongues, you're out there gobbling in tongues. Christ profits you nothing because you're not getting the teaching from the Word. You're not getting the Word of God. You're not getting rooted and grounded in the Word. Christ will profit you nothing. There's no benefit. Oh, you'll be saved if you accept His death, burial, and resurrection. You'll just be a carnal, confused Christian on your way ever since. Christ profits you nothing. Well, you're saved. There's a profit there for sure. But at the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble. The terrible trinity. Wood, hay, and stubble. Why don't you say that with me? Wood, hay, and stubble at the judgment seat of Christ. That's a problem. Let's make sure that we don't fall in that category. Look at verse 5. To whom we gave place by no subjection. In other words, Paul said, we didn't put up with it. We didn't tolerate it. We didn't let them come in and put us under a yoke of bondage. No, not for an hour. Today, our language, we would say, not for a minute. I won't tolerate that even for a minute. Well, back then they would say for an hour. I guess they were more patient. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's, what's another good analogy for bondage? Slavery. Well, this is what I'm saying. The law. The law. You're, if you're under the law, that's a form of slavery. That's bondage. You're a slave under the law, by the way. We're free men. We've been set free. Amen. 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 Well, let's read on. He says, No, not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now look at verse 6. But of these, he's talking about the 12 now, who seem to be somewhat. Oh, I just love this language. What a beautiful language this is. Do you understand what he's saying here? But of these who seem to be somewhat. In other words, these guys were important. Yeah, okay, they're important. They, they appear to be important. Why? Because they spent three years with Jesus, and Jesus handpicked them. And look at all the scripture they put together. And they're important in their own right, of course. Look what Paul says here. He's whispering now. This is in parenthesis. Whatsoever they were, it maketh no manner to me. In other words, I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are. I remember I got into an argument. It's been about two years now ago with that guy. What was his name? Bobby. Bobby. And the guy says, I have a PhD. And I said, Where'd you get your PhD from? He got it off the internet talking to some woman or something. He's got her own little class or something. That's not a legitimate PhD. And even if you have a PhD, I don't care. I met, I met a whole bunch of PhDs in China, some, some very intelligent, articulate scientists who believe in evolution. I said, that's science falsely so-called. You're, you're telling me that you're a PhD and you don't even know that God created the heavens and the earth. I have very little respect for you. I'm sorry. If you're not smart enough to figure out that God created the heavens and the earth. I remember when I was in sixth grade, I walked into a science class. And I saw for the first time this chart of 
the monkey turning into a man. Yeah. I wasn't saved, I wasn't a Christian, I wasn't reading the Bible, I was just a very young, not so smart, sixth grader. But I looked at that chart and I had been raised to know that there's a God, and I pray every night, Dad used to come into my room every night, pray with me before I went to sleep. I know there's a God. I don't know very much, but I know there's a God. And I looked at that chart and I burst out laughing. I mean, it was like the funniest, most ridiculous thing I'd ever seen in my life. That science teacher got very upset with me. What are you laughing at? I'm pointing at that chart laughing. I'm saying, you believe that monkeys turn into people? Really? And you're a teacher? Wow, he just about took me right out of his class. He wasn't too happy with me that day. And I didn't know any better, but I said, I know that's not true. I hadn't even read my Bible. You only need common sense to know that monkeys don't turn into people. Monkeys produce more monkeys and more monkeys and more monkeys, and people produce more and more people. Well, that was way back in the, I guess, early 70s or something? Late 60s, early 1970s? Yeah, early 70s. They didn't talk about DNA. They knew about it, but they didn't talk about it. It wasn't out in the public like it is now. We didn't, we didn't really start hearing about DNA until the O.J. trial. When O.J. Simpson was on trial, we heard, most of us, for the first time about DNA. And what is DNA? It, it, it deals with information. Do you know that there's information in your body, every cell of your, every living thing, not just people, every living thing has DNA. It's the blueprint of life. It's, it's information. When I talked to these scientists in China, I said to them, where did information come from? You show me the last book that nature wrote. I haven't read any books written by nature. And yet, there's language and there's information and there's intelligence designed in every living thing. How do you explain that? You can't without a God. Right? You have to begin with God. And then you move forward from there. That's another message. But Paul says, but contrary-wise, when they, when, oh, excuse me, verse 6, he said, it makes no matter to me, God accepts no man's person. In other words, God is no respecter of persons. So what if you were chosen by God during his earthly ministry? And there are the twelve. They don't take precedence over Paul's message. That's what he's saying here. I don't care who they were. I'm not impressed with your information. The Lord is speaking to me directly from heaven. And what he's telling me is different from what he told you. Your information is for Israel. And let me tell you something, because Paul's going to enlighten them. Your program is being shut down. You rejected your Messiah. Right? You said, we will not have this man rule over us. Not the twelve, of course. Right? Not even the little flock. But Israel as a whole said, we will not have this man, Jesus Christ, ruling over us. Their program was shut down. It was put on hold. God hit the pause button and shut Israel's program down. And Paul, speaking to the twelve, is catching them up to speed because they had very limited information. And they did not have the revelation of the mystery which was hidden which was kept secret before the foundation of the world. So Paul goes on, it, it makes no matter to me, God accepts no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. They weren't able to teach Paul. Paul was able to teach them. You know, and it's easy to get a big head. You get a little bit of something and you think a little is a lot. We can all be guilty of that. I know I have that. We get, a little, we get a little something. We think that little bit is a whole lot of something and it's a whole lot of nothing. we got to stay home. And Paul's speaking to these guys who maybe had a big head because they got to see God in the flesh. That's a big deal. We, we get excited because we run into some famous person. I remember I was in the shopping town mall so many years ago and I, I ran into Larry Holmes. Larry Holmes, former heavyweight champion of the world. And I'm laughing and talking and, you know, I'm shooting the breeze about boxing. With former heavyweight champion of the world. That was a great day for me. I never forgot that. I thought that was really special. I remember once I was walking to 
Plaza 81 McDonald's and I ran into Floyd Patterson, two-time heavyweight champion of the world, right? I'm laughing and talking and shooting a brief with former heavyweight champion of the world, Floyd Patterson, right? And I, 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 I met some other famous people, Vanessa Williams, I was married to her cousin, right? Got to, got to go to Vanessa's house. She's an amazing lady, beautiful, you know. It, you can easily get swept away because somebody's famous, some famous person. <laughs> but, Paul, but Paul says, God doesn't respect any person's person. Doesn't matter to him, he's no respecter of persons. God doesn't get starstruck because Michael Jackson is dancing on stage. God isn't going to be starstruck because he sees Muhammad Ali knock out George Foreman or some other spectacular thing that you and I might get very worked up over. Right? He doesn't care. He doesn't respect any man's person. And Paul says that. They were nothing to me in God. They didn't add anything to me. They didn't teach me anything. They didn't say, hey, Paul, let me about the time, let me tell you about the time Jesus and I were hanging out walking along the beach together and Jesus shared some stuff with me out of Zechariah and Ezekiel. <laughs> right? No. That's not, that didn't happen. Paul says they weren't able to add anything to me. But Paul was able to add something to them. As he said, you know something? Jesus spoke to me on the road to Damascus. Mm, yeah. Jesus blinded me. Jesus gave me my eyesight back shortly thereafter. Jesus gave me a dispensation of my own. He's dealing with us through grace, by grace, through faith. And it's a gift. And salvation is a free gift to Gentiles. And God's doing something different with the Gentile that, that, that he wasn't doing with the Jew. And we're not under the we're not under the law. You're still carrying the burden of the law. Right? And under Paul, we learn things we don't learn anywhere else in Scripture. And I'm going to get there in, in just a minute here. Look at verse 7. We see this word, but, and it's an amazing word. You know, we just read sometimes and we just take words for granted. We don't really think about what a word means. But is what we call an adversative of contrast. We're going to contrast two different things here. That's important that you see that as we're approaching this verse 7. That but is an adversative of contrast. And then he, he, he reinforces that because the very next word is contrary wise. So if anybody thinks that but is not an adversative of contrast that you can use in some other way, he's making sure that you don't draw that false conclusion. Because he says contrary wise. Right? Julius and I have argued with a handful of Christian brothers over this verse. And they refuse to accept this verse for what it absolutely says. But this thing is set up in such a way that you can't possibly walk away from this verse if you're an intellectually honest person and you know how to read and get the wrong information. So let's walk through this slowly and carefully. But contrary wise so he's setting up the contrast can we all see that mm -hmm. when they saw the gospel the good news when they saw that the gospel excuse me when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision so now we see Paul's gospel Paul's gospel which he's calling here the gospel of the uncircumcision. So that's category one. We have a category of gospel being set up. A, a type or kind of good news. What type or kind of good news is it? It is the good news of the uncircumcision. Who are the circumcision? The Jews are the circumcision. Who are the uncircumcised? The uncircumcised, like Titus, the Greek that Paul brought with him, those would be the Gentiles. Who is this gospel for? It is the gospel for the Gentiles. And whosoever would believe, of course. But this gospel is called the gospel of the uncircumcision. This is Paul's audience and his message. He says the gospel of the uncircumcision, I put emphasis on that, was committed unto me as, which means it's also true, what, is, what, what else is also true? It is also true that the gospel of the circumcision was committed unto Peter. Do we see the two gospels? 
We've got the gospel of the uncircumcision, and we have the gospel of the circumcision. The gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto Paul. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. He's preaching to Gentiles. And whoever else would listen, Jews as well. Right? But then you have a different gospel, a different message, which, which that gospel predated the crucifixion. The gospel of the circumcision, the good news of the circumcision, or the gospel of the kingdom, that gospel was being preached even before Christ died on the cross. Right? Peter. Peter preached that before Christ died on the cross. He preached it after Christ died on the cross. John the Baptist. He, John the Baptist preached it. Right? The, the message is different after the cross. And after Paul, specifically, not just after the cross, but after Paul's salvation, Paul is meeting with the twelve, and he's explaining this to them. Look at verse 8. For he, the Holy Spirit, God, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, he's talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in, Paul's, in Peter's ministry, the same, the same Holy Ghost, the same Holy Spirit, the same Lord, the same God, the same Father God, the same was mighty in me, Paul, toward the Gentiles. And when James, that's the Lord Jesus' half-brother, remember Jesus only had half-brothers and sisters, right? He had sisters. He had at least two sisters. He had sisters, they were his half-sisters. He had brothers, they were his half-brothers. Why were they half? Because they had the same mother, but not the not same, same father. father. Amen. <laughs> And when Jesus talked about, about God, what did he say? My father. Personal. My dad. My father. Well, let's read on. Look at verse 8. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, that's Peter, and John, those are the three top dogs. Who are the three top apostles? James, the Lord's half-brother. Peter, we know Peter, right? And John, the beloved, right? John the beloved, right? Who seem to be pillars. What does that mean? It means they were in charge. These were the strong apostles. These are the ones that took the lead. And when we're reading the book of Acts, which maybe we don't have time to get to now, I don't know, we see Peter and the eleven. Peter was standing up. Peter was addressing the nation of Israel. Peter was addressing the, the fathers. Peter was addressing the brethren. Peter stood up as the leader of the twelve. So we have these three are the pillars. These are the three strong alpha males in the group. James, Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who seem to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. What's the agreement? Let's look and see what the agreement is. Because we see the result clause introduced by the word that. That we should go unto the heathen. Let me tell you that word heathen. I, I think of uh, Fred Sanford and Esther, right? <laughs> Esther, Esther would call Fred Sanford. He said, you old heathen. <laughs> All right? You old Gentile, you. You old heathen. And they... Where were Peter and the eleven going? Unto the circumcision. So they shook hands, they came to an agreement, they understood God's plan and program. Paul, you go to the Gentiles, you go to the heathen, you go to the Gentiles with the gospel of grace, the gospel of the uncircumcision. Peter and the eleven, you've already gotten your instructions from the Lord during his earthly ministry. Your relationship is based on his earthly ministry. You continue doing what you're doing. You continue with water baptism. You continue teaching repentance. You continue with the gospel of the kingdom to Israel until that program is completely shut down. They agreed. They shook hands and they went their separate ways. Now look at verse 10. Question. Yes, Joe. Time period wise, do you think that this was before, after, or during, or around the time, or after the one year uh, 
stay that they got. It, it has to be after because Paul is saved in Acts chapter 9, mm -hmm. and that one year period ends. This was Acts 15. Right, but Peter, or uh, I can't think of his name, Stephen. Stephen. Stephen is stoned, and the stoning of Stephen. That happens before, I'm sorry. That's yeah, that's, okay. the, that, right. that's the end. Good. So that's the cutoff, and then Paul gets saved after Stephen is then stoned. Israel begins to. Fall. Absolutely. So there's this, this maybe about 30 years, somewhere in that neighborhood, about 30 years, there's a tr period of transition. Because Paul also says, if any man preaches any other gospel other than my gospel, let him be accursed. So there is this agreement. So these folks, and there's a period of transition. And during this period of transition, this short period of transition, however long it was, I, I don't know exactly, but during this short period of transition, they're still preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And then it's completely phased out and shut down. And, I, and I'm thinking that it probably was completely shut down when Paul has the complete message 100%. Because you can see, you can see he... He baptizes with water a little bit in the beginning, and then he says, oh, I'm so glad I didn't do any more of that. Yeah. Right? I, I baptized this house, that house, or anybody else I don't even remember. I hope I didn't do any more than that. Right? He says, Christ sent me not to baptize. And then we have that wonderful word again, but to preach the gospel. Preaching the gospel and water baptism are not the same thing. Right? <laughs> he says, unless... Unless it... And less, less it, uh, less it uh, make the cross of no effect. Of non effect, the right? No value to. You. In other words, Christ doesn't even profit you because you, you're trusting in your water baptism to save you, and there's no salvation in water baptism. Our gospel, Paul's gospel, Paul calls it my gospel three times in Scripture. It's personal, my gospel, not Peter's gospel. That's a different gospel. That's a different audience. Gospel of the uncircumcision is Paul. Gospel of the circumcision is Peter preaching to Jews who are under the covenant and under the law of Moses. So we got to make sure, folks, that we are rightly dividing the word of truth, that we understand the difference between what Paul preached and what Peter preached, what the twelve preached. Why is Paul misunderstood today? He's misunderstood because of several reasons. One reason is people don't believe what the Word of God says. They don't believe what Peter says here in uh, 2 Peter 3.16. They don't believe it. They hear it. They see it. And they, they try to force his words to say what they want it to say. So they can continue lumping Paul in and saying that Paul was one of the twelve. Well, the Holy Spirit tells you. When Peter stands up with the eleven and is preaching in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit says, Peter in the 11. The Holy Spirit accepts Matthias as the 12th apostle. And if you read what the Word of God has to say, we're running out of time today. Maybe we'll have to do a part two. But when we get to the book of Acts, we have to see what God says about Paul's ministry. About God's commissioning Paul. What is Paul's commission? When we look at what Paul's commission is, and we compare Paul's commission to the commission of the 12, they're vastly different. They were sent to water baptize. That's part of their commission. Paul was not sent to baptize. That is not part of his commission. Paul says you're saved by grace through faith without any works of any kind. You read Romans chapter 8 and you find out you cannot lose your salvation in this dispensation. But you read the letters that were written to the Jews. You read the book of Hebrews, not written by Paul, not Pauline, right? The book of Hebrews opens up and it says, in times past. And it deals with the ages to come because it deals with the tribulation period. And during the tribulation period, they have to endure to the end to be saved. You learn that in Matthew, you read the Olivet Discourse. You get into Hebrews chapter 6 and you learn very quickly that during that time period, people who profess to be saved people who worship the beast or receive the mark of the beast, lose whatever hope for salvation right. that they have. That is not true of you and I. There's a huge difference between what Paul teaches in Romans to Philemon and everything else that's taught by the twelve, by the apostles. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Hebrews to the book of Revelation. Why is Paul misunderstood? because people don't like reading. And they don't like to study. 
to show themselves approved unto God, workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, and they don't believe what they see when it's put right there in front of them. They'd rather argue, fuss, and fight than to live by faith and to let God's word say what it says and by faith believe what it says. That's why Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. You never hear Peter say, or John say, or James say, follow me as I follow Christ, or anything even close to that. Paul says, follow me. Paul is the pattern for today. Paul is the pattern moving forward until the rapture of the church. Amen? Amen. We're going to put this close with a word of prayer. And I'm going to ask Jennifer to close with a word of prayer this morning. And we're thankful. And before we close, let me say one thing quickly while we're still on tape here too. If you're out listening today to this message and, and you want to be a saved person, you would like to be a member of the body of Christ, you want to have a relationship with God, you want to know that your sins are forgiven, that gospel that we've been talking about this morning is called the gospel of the grace of God. That gospel to the uncircumcised is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. How is a person saved? Very simply, you are to believe three things. That Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins, that he was buried, and that he was actually dead. That's what it means when it says he's buried, he was actually dead in the ground, and that he was resurrected, he was raised from the dead on the third day. The very instant that you believe in Christ, death on the cross is payment in full for your sins, that he, that he was buried, dead in the ground for three days, and that he was raised, he was resurrected from the dead on the third day. You are eternally forgiven, you are cleansed, you are saved, you are put in right relationship with God. It's very simple. Believe in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and you will be saved today. So we're going to ask Jennifer to close us with a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for bringing us together to study your word, but most importantly, to rightly divide your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.